Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another uh, Planetarium show. I almost forgot what I normally say. <laughs> um, my name is Jessica. I'm the director of the Planetarium. And with me tonight is uh, our grad student who works in the Planetarium. He's about to graduate and leave us, which makes me so sad. Um, but I will let her introduce herself. Hi, I am Lindsay. I'm a physics graduate student at UMD. And we want to keep her here. I shouldn't have brought it up. I know I'm just making myself sad. Anyway, um, happy things. So uh, we've got a super fun show tonight um, that Lindsay has honestly been working on for almost two years now. Um, we've done it a few times. The History of Space Flight, which looks at the amazing women behind launching us off of planet Earth into the universe. Um, and we've got some fun updates this time. I don't know if I'm taking that away from you. Sorry if I, um, that's one of the things that is always fun with the show, even though, you know, we've done it a few times, been working on it for a few years. I feel like you've always got someone new added or something new added every time we do it. So, um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Lindsay. Oh, and as always, if you have questions, you can leave them down in the comments. Um, I will keep an eye out on those and we'll let Lindsay know if uh, any of questions if any questions come up. Okay. So this is our first three of space flight show. Um, as Jessica said, uh, one of the things that I enjoy, well, there's a few things that I enjoy about this show. Uh, one is getting recognition for all those women that have been in space flight throughout history that have not gotten recognition. Um, and also just um, uh, learning new things um, about new women pretty much every time I do this show. So. Yeah, there is an update today too. Uh, you might know it already if you've been watching the news, uh, but I will show you that in a little bit. So first we are going to start with the women who worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, so this, when the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, you might know it as JPL, when it was first formed, uh, it was not part of NASA yet. Um, and at the time, it was mostly trying to make rockets for weapons, uh, especially for, you know, World War II. Uh, so these women, uh, they did all of the calculations. They were the human computers. So the male engineers would come up with the ideas and then the females would calculate all of the stuff with a paper and pencil, they would calculate the trajectories, they would calculate, you know, how much fuel was needed uh, for a particular uh, trajectory. Um, and um, some people think that JPL Navy had more women, this is quite a few women, considering this is back in like the 40s and 50s. Um, JPL had a little bit more of a relaxed atmosphere than like NASA and like the military. And so that kind of allowed them to have uh, more women uh, employed there uh, as the human computers. But again, no, none of these women were able to become engineers. Oh. So there's two um, organizations that are in the running to go to space. Uh, one is JPL, obviously, and then the other uh, is the U.S. Navy um, and what will eventually become NASA. Well, since JPL's um, history is with uh, military weapons, uh, they think that it might um, look bad to have them put the first rocket into space. And so they have the Navy do it. So the, they made the Jupiter C rocket. Um, the Navy, but it did not make it to space. It blew up. But uh, JPL was working on their own rocket uh, in secret, the Vanguard project, and this was able to make it to space. Um, and it was, yeah, so the first rocket into space. Uh, okay, so Macy Roberts, uh, 
she is right back over here. Um, she was the supervisor of the human computers for many, many years. Um, they were really picky about who ended up in the human computers. Um, she didn't necessarily just hire women, but she was really looking for a group of human computers that really worked well together. Um, so, you know, she could hire men also, but she was worried that some of them maybe wouldn't be okay taking, um, you know, directions from a woman or working with other women, um, or even if they hired a woman, a woman and she didn't get along with everybody, um, then that just, you know, wouldn't work out. So Macy Roberts was the, um, the head of this uh, human computing group for a long time at JPL. Uh, okay, Barbara Paulson, she was one of the first uh, female human computers here. Um, in this picture, she is getting her 25 year pin. And um, she began in 1948 and didn't retire until 1993. So she was there a long time. Uh, she worked on those uh, rockets that ended up going into space. Um, her favorite spacecraft, she says, that she worked on uh, is this one right here. Uh, and this is the Mariner probe, oops, sorry, uh, that would later be sent to uh, Venus and Mars. Okay, Janez Lawson is this woman right here. Um, so she was the first um, black person uh, male or female to work at JPL. She actually went to school for engineering where she also was the only um, black person in her engineering class. And she saw an advertisement for human computers to work at JPL uh, at her school. And she noticed that um, it didn't say anything about needing a degree. So she knew that even though she had an engineering degree, um, they probably would hire her as a woman uh, since they weren't requiring degrees. Actually, most of these women didn't have degrees. They were just really good at math, um, but Janaz Lawson did. Uh, but so she was hired at JPL, but again, not as an engineer. Unfortunately, she still had to be a human computer even though uh, she had that engineering degree. Uh, Sylvia Lundy, uh, this is one of my faves. So she worked as a human computer for really, for quite a while at JPL. Um, and so this trajectory map that you're seeing here is for the Voyager spacecrafts. So what happened is, so we have Voyager 1 leaving Earth, going by Jupiter, going by Saturn, and then going out into the rest of space. And then we have another one, Voyager 2, going to Jupiter, going to Saturn, going to Uranus and Neptune. So as the spacecraft go by each of these planets, the gravity of those planets kind of tug on the uh, spacecraft to kind of make it change trajectory. And so um, she was the one that calculated like how the spacecraft needed to approach like Jupiter in order for them to get bent the right amount uh, in their trajectory so that they end up at Saturn. And then how close the spacecraft needs to be at Saturn in order for its trajectory to get bent by the gravity uh, and go out to Uranus and Neptune. Uh, and it was really important that this actually go uh, as scheduled because um, the planets um, and kind of how close they are in this trajectory, uh, this wasn't gonna kind of line up for many, many years. Um, so it was, yeah, really important to get this down. And both of these spacecraft are still going through space. And uh, one of them, uh, Voyager 2, I think, is the collecting information still. Yeah, it's Voyager 2. Sue Finley, she actually is still at JPL. She has been working on these spacecraft for um, 60 years. She is 81. Um, and she 
does not, she was one of the women that did not have a college degree, but again, loved math. Um, and so she worked on the Mariner program, uh, which went to Mars and Venus and Mercury. Um, and her favorite mission that she worked on was Venera, which uh, was a spacecraft that landed on Venus. Um, but the most recent spacecraft uh, that she worked on is Juno, which is this spacecraft right here. And it is currently orbiting around Jupiter as we speak. Okay, moving on to the Mercury 13. So the Mercury 13 were a group of women that underwent astronaut training at the same time as the astronauts, the male astronauts at NASA. They underwent all the same testing and everything. Um, they did not unfortunately end up being able to become astronauts. So this video that I'm gonna show you kind of shows all the stuff, all the tests that they did um, and what happened to prevent them from going into space. While the Americans were recruiting astronauts, the Soviets continued to rack up firsts in space. In 1963, they launched Valentina Tereshkova, their first female cosmonaut. She flew 48 orbits. At the Lovelace Clinic in New Mexico, a top secret program was underway to recruit a corps of female astronauts. They were dubbed the Mercury 13. They did extraordinarily well in the tests and they surpassed the men in some ways. And uh, that was a function of their uh, different body type. And they wound up with uh, 20 or so ladies that were all suitable candidates. And of those uh, 20 or 24 that took the tests, 13 were found to be adequate and appropriate candidates for the space program. It didn't happen because they were 20 years ahead of their time. The program never received any kind of encouragement from NASA. In fact, uh, active steps were taken to quash it. And so the ladies, ladies who had been given tremendous stimulation and they were all very excited about being astronauts and everybody at Lovelace thought they were gonna be astronauts were suddenly told that they couldn't be. Jerry Cobb and her team were ready and eager to fly when the program was suddenly halted. No explanation was ever given to them, although the orders apparently came from the highest level. I've seen a copy of a memo from Vice President Lyndon Johnson in which he uh, was requiring uh, James Webb to look into the suitability of women as candidates for space. And in Lyndon Johnson's handwriting across the bottom, instead of a signature, was the phrase, let's put a stop to this now. And that apparently was the death knell of the Mercury 13's aspirations to go into space. Most of them never knew about this till years later. But, and they never gave up. To this day, they uh, still are looking for a ride. They want to go in space. There's no difference in capability of, of pilots, whether women or men. But the problem was there were no women with experience in research and development. So you pick the guys with experience in research and development. And that, that's just a smart way of doing it. Valentina Tereshkova would be the last woman in space until Sally Ride boarded an American space shuttle two decades later. By the end of 1963, the total number of astronauts had risen to 30. They'd all be vying for the 20 available seats on Gemini. Okay, so uh, as was mentioned there, uh, the problem and with why they didn't go up into space is because they were not test pilots in the military. And that is 
because the military actually didn't allow females to be test pilots at the time. So there were several things working against them. Um, I do have some exciting news though. Wally Funk, she was one of the Mercury 13 and she just a few weeks ago got to go up in the into space uh, with Jeff Bezos. Uh, so this clip um, from MSNBC, uh, you'll also see Mae Jemison uh, talking about the significance of this, Mae Jemison being the first uh, African-American uh, female in space. May, we've been talking about the science and, and sort of the, the brains and the brain power of this mission, if you will. Can we take a moment to talk about the heart of this mission, kind of the, the emotional core of it? And that is, frankly, Wally Funk, 82 years young. She, I think we have some tape of her exploding out of the capsule after she landed back on Earth. She was, if you watched her in the run-up uh, to this flight uh, in the coverage, she was ecstatic to be on this, to be finally making this journey decades after she was not allowed to do so because she's a woman, to now taking this flight. Um, this moment for her is incredibly special, but you, ha you have to think it's special for a lot of people, a lot of women in particular, who are looking at her and going, yep, you know, not to be cheesy, dreams do come true, right? She is making history now as the oldest person ever to go into space. Um, and she's she's making her own personal history too. As you, as you see this shot, I think if we, if we let it play here, she's about to walk out. Well, you know, I don't think it's just for women when you say dreams come true. I think right. it is a story for all of us, right? And the very interesting part about space exploration and what happened in the 1960s with the Mercury 13 is that there were 13 women who did not only as well as, but better than the, the men who had been tested with the right stuff, right? And we made a decision not to let them fly not to have them involved. So as we progress and we got different perspectives and we bring different people in, it makes a really big difference on how the public sees space exploration and how the world sees space exploration and how it's actually used and how much we invest in it and how much we yeah. gain from it. Uh, Dr. Mae Jemison, thank you so much for your perspective and your expertise this morning. So super exciting for Wally Funk, uh, one of the Mercury 13 women. May we be? Okay. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some hidden figures at NASA. So these are women kind of working behind the scenes at NASA uh, instead of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, so this is, you may recognize these women from the movie Hidden Figures. Um, We've got Dorothy Vaughn, Katherine Johnson, and um, Mary Jackson. So uh, Dorothy Vaughn, um, well, first of all, all of these women were human computers at NASA at one point. Um, Dorothy Vaughn um, ended up becoming the supervisor of the West Area Computers. And um, when in the 1960s, when uh, NASA started getting, you know, electronic computers and not uh, that were eventually going to replace the human computers, you know, she saw that she was going to become, um, you know, unnecessary. And so she uh, learned how to use these electronic computers and became an expert on the electronic computers and also taught all of her human computers how to use these new uh, electronic computers. Um, Katherine Johnson, uh, she helped uh, find the trajectory for getting some of our different um, uh, manned space flights uh, up into space. And she worked at NASA all the way through the shuttle program. Uh, Mary Jackson ended up becoming an engineer. She was the only woman and the only black person in her engineering class. Um, and she became NASA's first black female engineer in 1958. Uh, Katherine Johnson now has a building named after her. Um, and actually I think Dorothy Vaughn, uh, Mary Jackson also has a building named after her in Washington, DC. So we got a question, Lindsay, mm -hmm. um, which I don't actually know the answer to. 
Um, so questions from my mom. Hi, mom. Uh, how accurate was the movie Hidden Figures to their real life accomplishments? Well, I heard that some of the, um, frankly, white savior parts of the storyline were kind of made to be a good movie. Um, so, yeah, so some of the, um, like I think when her like um, supervisor goes and like, you know, knocks down the sign for the colored bathrooms because she'd been having to go all the way across the um, NASA campus just to go to the bathroom. Um, some of that was kind of played up for the movie. Um, but other than that, uh, like the part where um, Neil Armstrong uh, actually doesn't trust the electronic computers and wants Katherine Johnson to check the electronic computers calculations, that actually did happen. That is a true story. Okay, next is uh, Margaret Hamilton, another one of my faves. And her story is just um, super uh, cute. And so I'm just gonna have her tell you her story. They announced that they were looking for people to do programming to send man to the moon. And I just thought, wow, <laughs> I've got to go there. <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Upper Peninsula. I just enjoyed school, but there was something about math that I just liked more than everything else. I liked deriving the answers because I didn't want to memorize. It was too much. I was lazy. When my husband was in law school, they wanted the law wives, my being one of them, to pour tea. And I said to my husband, no way am I pouring tea as a Harvard law wife. If I go to Harvard law school, fine, I'll do what the men do, but I'm not going to be put in that position. And he was very proud of me that I had taken that stand. They announced that they were looking for people to do programming to send man to the moon. I was the first programmer they hired. I came up with the term software engineering and it was considered a joke. What, software is engineering? <laughs> Mostly men were working there and they had somebody at home to take care of their kids. I had no choice. I'd bring my daughter, Lauren, into work nights and weekends, and she'd see me playing astronaut to test the software and doing the kinds of things the astronaut would do. So she wanted to do it too, so she played astronaut. And all of a sudden, everything came crashing on the simulator. And I realized that what she had done is that she selected the pre-launch program during flight I said, oh my God, this is not good. We really need to put a protection in there because the astronaut really could do what she did by mistake. I tried to get it through MIT, NASA. No, they said, astronauts are trained never to make a mistake. was an emergency. Everything happened that we thought would happen if they made the mistake. So then there was a decision, go, no, go, land or don't land. Fortunately, the people at Mission Control trusted our software and they said, go, go, go. The software and the hardware worked perfectly. The software was on the ground <laughs> and on the moon. That's one small step for man. One 
example speaks of the American spirit of discovery that exists in every little girl and little boy. We know that somehow to look beyond the heavens is to look deep within ourselves. Being fearless, even when the experts say no, it doesn't make sense. They didn't believe it. Nobody did. It was something that we were dreaming of happening, but it became real. <laughs> I say this every time we do this show, and it's true every time, just chills. I adore her so much. Okay, next we have Jo Ann Morgan. She was the only woman uh, in mission control during the Apollo missions. Um, and actually, she was such a good engineer that she actually uh, worked uh, in the control center before she actually had her engineering degree. Um, so yeah, she did have to deal with some, you know, sexism and stuff, but uh, luckily her supervisor kind of uh, helped her with that um, so she could be in the control center. Uh, Poppy Northcutt, um, she also was uh, during the Apollo program um, and her, um, her work helped bring astronauts back from the moon. So she worked on the calculating of the trajectory um, from the moon back to the Earth. Okay, Ethel Heineke Brower. Um, she was um, in the flight mechanics branch at NASA. So she and also the last woman, Poppy Northcutt, they both worked on the calculations and trajectories to get Apollo 13 home. I realized that the Apollo 13 movie is now like old, really old and people maybe don't know Apollo 13 very much anymore or it was not as uh, well known as it was. So what happened was there was some damage done to Apollo 13, the spacecraft, uh, as it was launched up into space, and it uh, could not land on the moon. And so since it wasn't going to be landing on the moon, getting a bunch of moon rocks and things like that, uh, the trajectories that they had initially um, created that accounted for those rocks and stuff uh, had to be redone so that they could make it back to Earth safely without all that extra mass. Uh, among other things that they had to fix. Uh, Margaret Brennecke, um, she was the first female welding engineer at NASA's Marshall Space Flight uh, Center. She was also a part of the Apollo program. Uh, Barbara Crawford Johnson, um, she was an engineer tasked with bringing the Apollo astronauts home safely during the last leg of each flight, the atmospheric re-entry. Uh, Billy Robertson, um, she was a mathematician and she ended up working uh, at NASA um, a little bit before Apollo, but then during the Apollo mission, um, she helped create some of the first computer models for the launches. Uh, Judy Sullivan, um, she was the first uh, woman engineer in spacecraft operations in 1966. She was an engineer for the biomedical system. Um, and so here uh, is uh, Neil Armstrong and he's getting all of the sensors tested on his spacesuit. Um, and then so here's Judy Sullivan during the flight, uh, making sure that all of the uh, medical sensors um, are, uh, you know, proper 
like the body temperature and everything like that is where it should be, respiration. Uh, Mary Golda Ross, uh, she is the first uh, Native American woman. Mary Golda Ross was the first known Native American female engineer and the first female engineer in the history of Lockheed. She was one of the 40 founding engineers of the renowned and highly secretive Skunk Works project at Lockheed Corporation. Mary was a dedicated Lockheed employee from 1942 until her retirement in 1973. During her 31 years at the company, she was best remembered for her work on aerospace design, including the Agena rocket program. Mary also worked on numerous design concepts for interplanetary space travel, manned and unmanned Earth orbiting flights, and the earliest studies of orbiting satellites for both defense and civilian purposes. Born in the small town of Park Hill, Oklahoma, Mary was the great-great-granddaughter of Cherokee Chief John Ross, who led the Cherokee people on their arduous trail of tears. She was a talented child and by age 20 earned a bachelor degree in mathematics from Northeastern State Teachers College and received her master's degree from the Colorado State Teachers College. She moved to California to begin her career at Lockheed as a mathematician. By the late 1960s, Mary became a senior advanced systems staff engineer, working on the Polaris reentry vehicle, Poseidon. and Trident missiles. After retiring in 1973, Mary continued to encourage women and Native American youth to pursue careers in math and engineering. She was inducted into the Silicon Valley Engineering Hall of Fame in 1992 and was a Society of Women Engineers Fellow. Mary died in April 2008, several months before her 100th birthday and left a $400,000 endowment to the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. Tonight, we honor Mary Golda Ross with her induction into the Women in Aviation International Pioneer Hall of Fame. Okay, so the first female in space was uh, Valentina Tereshkova. Um, she was part of the Soviet Union at the time. That was in 1963. Um, and to this day, she's still regarded as the youngest woman in space, and she's the only woman to make a solo space flight. Uh, Svetlana Savitskaya, the second woman um, in space in 1982, she was the first woman on a space station and a first woman to do a spacewalk and the first woman to do two space flights. Okay, so finally, America gets in the game with the female astronauts. Sally Ride being the first one in 1983. Uh, Catherine D. Sullivan, um, the first American woman to uh, perform a spacewalk in 1984. Uh, Shannon Lucid, in 1985, uh, first Chinese born woman in space, uh, and also the first woman to do at least three space flights. Uh, Millie Hughes Fulford in 1991, she was the first female payload specialist. Eileen Collins in 1999, she became the first female space shuttle and uh, commander. Uh, Peggy Whitson, uh, the oldest female spacewalker at age 47. Uh, so this happened, uh, her last trip into space was in 2017. Uh, again, she became the oldest female spacewalker at age 47. She also, uh, if you add up all of her time spent in space uh, through all of her trips, she is uh, has the longest amount of time spent in space by any NASA astronaut, male or female, and that is uh, 665 days, and she's eighth place for time and space among all astronauts around the world. Isn't she going back? Like, I, th I thought I remembered reading something a few weeks ago that, like, she's uh, going to be, is it a pilot? Is she a pilot? Um, I'm not... um, but that she she was going to be one of the, the leads for one of the private sector um, space shuttles, space 
spaceships. So another woman uh, benefiting from some of these private spacecraft. Yeah. And I, I don't remember which one, but I remember hearing that like she was getting back into it and she was gonna she was picked as one of the, the leads for one of the private sector ships. Which is really awesome for her. Uh, so some of the books, if you want to learn more about these women, uh, Rise of the Rocket Girls is all about the women who worked at JPL, um, Galaxy Girls, um, about women in space. Uh, and then we have two on the Mercury 13 specifically. Also, there's a Mercury 13 documentary on Netflix. Oh, there is? I didn't know that. No. Oh, I'm gonna have to add that. I need to go watch that. Very cool. And you're right, I did get, oh no, where'd my Zoom go? Hold on, sorry. I had to go and play around with the setting and it made Zoom disappear. There we go. We're back. Okay. I need to not fiddle with settings when we're in the middle of a stream. Um, yeah, I did get teary at the new video. <laughs> Holly Funk. Oh my gosh, I was just full of, so excited for her. I'm finally getting it up into yeah. space. Uh, it's just, it's crazy. There was another video where they were getting in interviewed and uh, Jeff Bezos was talking about, um, you know, how she was kind of known in the Mercury 13 and the other women of the Mercury 13 for sometimes doing better than the men back then. And he said, she still does better than them. They are always trying to catch up with her when they go for a run. <laughs> <laughs> At like 80 something? Yeah. That's amazing. Oh. I'm like speechless. I can't even. Um, so we we don't have any more questions at the moment. We did get a comment about I think it's pronounced Leka, which is the the Russian dog. Yeah. Um, who was also a girl. Yeah, that is a good point actually. Um, which I didn't know much about her, and I did a little googling while you were talking, and now I'm like really sad. Yeah. It's not a happy ending. No, it's not. I didn't want to know that. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, great show, as always, Lindsay. And this is the sad ending to the lake uh, going up into space. Do I have to tell people? <laughs> the dog didn't survive. <laughs> Yeah, let's just say that they put the dog up into space, not expecting it to come back to Earth alive. Yeah. I don't like it. Um, all right. Uh, if anyone has any other questions or sad stories you want to share, <laughs> um, go ahead and leave them in the comments um, or some happy stories. I think, I think it would be good to go back to the happy Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Oh, no, Lindsay, would you go to space? Um, I think so. Yeah. I'm a little worried about, though, if we start sending a bunch of people to the moon and Mars and, like, things start happening, like mining on the moon and Mars, that would not be good, in my opinion. So if we could, you know, have fun in space, but not start taking advantage of the resources. Yeah. I like I can't make up my mind. Part of me wants to say yes, I would go just for the like experience and to say you did it. But also I have a panic attack flying on an airplane. There's no way I could get through flight on a rocket into space. Like I think if they could knock me out and wake me up once we're actually in space, I would be good. But I don't Want it. And my mom, if she's still here, can attest to, I, I do not fly well. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, let me tell everyone a bit about what you can expect over the next week. Um, so next Wednesday, uh, we've got a show all about the scale and wonders of the universe uh, to kind of look at exactly how big the universe really is and some of the crazy stuff that's in it. And then next Saturday 
is the next edition in our exploration series taking a look at space junk. So those are things like meteoroids, asteroids, and comets. Um, also, we finally have all the details nailed down for our Dark Sky Caravan this year. Uh, we're doing a bit of a hybrid model, so not quite the same as we did the first two years, but not fully virtual like last year. So we'll start off the week, um, August 9th and 10th, with some virtual shows. And then the 11th through 14th will be star parties at different locations. Uh, and you can see the locations here. And also find more information about it on our website. I have a direct link to that in the video description. All right. Well, I guess we will wrap it up there. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so thank you, Lindsay. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the show as much as we love presenting it. Uh, and have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and we will see you next time. Bye, everyone.